You're listening to The Savings Tip Jar, hosted by Dom Beattie and Harrison Asprey. Powered by InfoChoice, your choice of financial news, guides and product comparison. Hey guys, yes, another day, another dollar in The Savings Tip Jar with myself, Dom Beattie, and the financial flogger, Harrison Asprey. Now has, at a dollar per episode, I believe that brings us up to $50 in the jar now, the big pineapple. Yeah, there we go, 50 Australian pesos. Um, I was looking at some data earlier, you know, it's the same batting average as Alan Border and um, and a few other esteemed Australian batsmen over the years, so not too shabby. Um, credit to our sponsors, InfoChoice and savings.com.au for keeping us on the air and not pulling the pin just yet. Um, and I should mention that we're breaking new ground here for episode 50. So um, as our special guest for today, uh, we have Jessica Lung from Global X ETFs to talk about share trading. Now, for those familiar with the pod, uh, we haven't really uh, branched out into share trading or talking about it uh, very much at all. It's been pr- primarily home loan savings accounts and all that good banking stuff. Um, and you'll find a, a pretty interesting chat later in the pod. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we also have one of our um, esteemed colleagues uh, Harry O'Sullivan here to talk about uh, his grocery price index so you'll probably note that the uh, that the ABS has a CPI so consumer price index we have in development right now a grocery price index and Harry's here to talk about that um, a bit later on which we thought was pretty timely with all this stuff around woolies and coals and and whatnot um, so yeah another good episode ahead uh, stick around um, but if you'll allow me Dom I'll talk about the first news item of the Tell episode it. And it's a pretty big one, I might add, because um, the Australian Competition Tribunal, so the ACT, um, has approved ANZ's acquisition of Suncorp Bank. So um, if you know much about banking, um, you'll know that this has been in the works for quite a while now, since 2022. Um, And the ACCC, so the competition regulator, um, actually blocked it late last year. Um, But ANZ took this to the tribunal um, and they've now approved the acquisition. So it was originally slated to be worth around $4.9 billion, um, and that's to acquire Suncorp's banking arm. So as, as you might know, they have insurances and banking. So this is home loans, savings accounts, all that all that good stuff. Um, and there was, it, it was really up in the air for quite a while because the ACCC, as I said, blocked it. Um, and they said it would lessen competition. Um, and then... Somewhere along the lines as well, uh, Bendigo Bank put its hand up to acquire Suncorp Bank, um, which probably would have been a kind of deal in in shares and and script, as they call it. Um, and then Bendigo Bank come out swinging this morning, saying it will significantly lessen competition in Australian banking. So, but ANZ said it will enable um, the the big bank to better compete in Queensland, which is where Suncorp's from, um, and to better compete with the likes of NAB, Combank, and Westpac as well. So, But but even despite that, Dom, that's still going to be the fourth largest bank uh, despite acquiring Suncorp. So what did you make of this movement? And this move is evolving as the day goes on. Yeah, obviously it's a pretty big move in uh, the Australian bank, banking landscape. Um, and, but, you know, I must say, like, I can't think of, you know, too many sort of standout banking products that uh, Suncorp offers in uh, Australia. So, you know, fr- from a consumer perspective, you know, maybe this will turn out to be a good thing. I don't know. I mean, obviously it doesn't sound good for consumers having less competition in the sector. Um, but, you know, as we've seen in some other sectors like the superannuation sector, uh, when we see some of the bigger funds swallowing up the smaller ones, they end up sometimes offering better products for consumers. So maybe that'll happen. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, we won't know for, well, several years probably. So um, in some other news, there's uh, a record gap now between house and unit values. Yeah. So this uh, divergence that uh, we've spoken about in the past, um, this story was covered for Savings to Come to AU by Denise Raywood, one of our new journos in the team comes to us with uh, decades of experience in the industry. Um, so she wrote, the difference between the median capital city house value and unit value is now 45.2% or almost 294,000 according to CoreLogic. 
Well, um, so what it found was before the pandemic in March 2020, the gap, so referred to as the house premium, was 16.7%, uh, whereas now, yes, 45.2%. So that's a pretty big gap. Um, so across the capital cities, average gap, yeah, like I said, was 16.7% and now it's 452 um, and it's swinging back the other way, actually, in some areas, as home buyers are priced out of houses altogether and are chasing units as a compromise. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's natural that houses are always going to cost more than units. Uh, you I mean you're getting more um, land, and well, you're actually getting land. land. I guess when you're you're buying a unit, you're you're not really buying the land; you're just buying the the apartment um, unit itself. Um, and as we know, you know, house prices, you know, with because of the land value, tend to go up uh, in value more often, uh, sort of more so than than units do. Um, but you know, as as Denise pointed out in the article, um, house houses just become more and more unaffordable. People will just turn to units instead. So maybe that will be a, a great equalizer and help narrow the gap again. Uh, what do you reckon, has? Yeah, I mean, in some areas for sure, the the gap um, or more and more transactions are in units, um, just because people are priced out of their area for a house, um, especially in those sort of Sydney suburbs where um, you see, like for example, you know Bondi, some of those like lifestyle sort of suburbs um, where houses are just ridiculously priced, but there's actually quite a lot of units out there. And not to say that the units are cheap, but if you're determined on staying put in an area um i would much prefer to strategically buy a unit and then then move out you know far out from your friends family uh face a longer commute or, or whatever it may be uh just in the name of buying a house and a lot of the new housing developments that maybe are more affordable they're in usually far out places it's a bit of a harder slog um and it's not not really um ideal for a lot of people so uh for me personally like if if it wasn't a house, like I'd be looking at a ground floor apartment with maybe like a bit of a garden like or something. Cool, yeah. Um, yeah, just something a, a bit more um, that has a semblance of space. Uh, yeah. But of course, if you have a big family or uh, you have more kids on the way, or you you need a um, a big beat laboratory for your for your uh, up up for, yeah for your little uh, upstart podcast, um, you might still prefer a house. But yeah, I guess it's a uh, it's good to see the data. Uh, come through on uh, on a sort of thought that we've all sort of thought that houses are just ridiculously way ahead of units, um, and that gap's only widened in the in the pandemic as everyone wanted more space for their study and to stay away from you know family members and COVID and spicy cough and all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, a good bit of research out there. Um, for our last news topic of the day, I, I thought I'd talk about this new uh, app called Subi, and it's not for Subaru owners, um, but it's an app for uh, converting your annual leave into um, cold hard cash, essentially. So Subi is a new um, fintech that partners with with businesses and, and employers um, and, and existing accounting software such as Xero and, and YOB uh, to cash in um, people's leave balances. Um, so um, if you're an employee and you have a large balance um, of leave, uh, say more than 20 days or around four weeks, you know, you might have been tapped on the shoulder by your employer to say, hey, maybe you take a holiday, take a break. Uh, but if you can't really afford to do that or, you know, you don't want to do that, um, this new app allows you to cash it in um, up to the value of two weeks worth of leave. Um, so the the rule is you've got to have at least 20 days of leave built up and then you can cash in up to two weeks. Subi's sort of um, has, has marketed this as a good approach to you know, smoothing over costs of living, um, to take care of some bills uh, without resorting to credit cards and personal loans and, and stuff that bears interest. So um, although it, it is kind of funny because I think if you had a frank discussion with your employer and said, hey, I've got all this leave, but I have nowhere to go, I can't afford to go anywhere, or I'd, I just don't want to take it off, um, I'm sure a lot would come to the party, um, especially a lot of b bigger businesses, they'd be able to afford the, the slight payout. Um, but for those smaller businesses who might not be able to afford, you know, two, three, four grand of a hit, um, this new app could prove worthwhile. Um, and it's, it's free to use as well, um, at least in the meantime. Uh, I think they said that they're planning on introducing some employer fees to, for, to use the app as well. Um, but it could still be a benefit to small businesses. But yeah, we'll, we'll see if 
if this app is uh, worthwhile in the months and years to come or if they're kind of providing a service that isn't needed. Um, but what do you make of this? Yeah, well, I think with this one, certainly uh, the employer has to be on board with it. Uh, as you said, you know, some might be like, oh, well, no, I'd rather you take leave because, uh, well, effectively, I mean, you're earning more money. You're, you're increasing your uh, annual pay by, um, you know, you're getting this extra payment uh, and then you're working that those four weeks you're entitled to on top of that. So you're effectively increasing your, your annual salary. So uh like you said some employers can afford it but some probably can't so but if, if they're open to do it to, to doing that and um and you're, you're willing to sacrifice holidays just for a bit of extra cash then, then certainly it's good to have that option um cool all right that brings us to the end of our new segment but time to chat to our colleague finance journalist harry o'sullivan All right, now time to talk about grocery prices. Now, these have been making headlines a lot recently with uh, all of the sort of government inquiries that are being launched. We've seen state governments like here in Queensland launch an inquiry into uh, supposed uh, price gouging by supermarkets. Uh, and then we've also had, um, you know, federal government investigations there. And then we had the, uh, the ACTU release a report as well. Um, obviously, they're going to have their slants on it, but uh, they did sort of manage to get former ACCC head uh, Alan Fells to head up that report, even though he's uh, retired and uh, in his 80s now, he's still uh, still got it, apparently, able to launch an investigation of his own and a full report into price gouging. But joining us to discuss is our resident grocery price expert and uh, the writer of the Savings Grocery Price Index, or GPI, Harry O'Sullivan. G'day, Harry. Hey, Dom. Hey, Harrison. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting one, Harry. Uh, our, our very own index or something. Um, so you've been feverishly going down to Coles and Woolies every month, tracking the prices or just going online. Um, but what have you noticed in the last few months? Um, I think the index shows that, you know, prices are kind of flat on a few things. Um, is all the heat on the on Coles and Woolies kind of working or, or do you think that this is just how it is? Yeah, so um, obviously we, we've only had this for three months or so. So in that time, there haven't been the dramatic price increases that we would expect over like a a longer period but i think that that the thing that startled me the most about doing this is seeing just how closely the prices at coles and the prices of woolies just they just match one another stroke for stroke i think the only products on there where there's a consistent discrepancy was um white sugar where i think coles you can get it for 30 cents cheaper and that's been consistent for the last three months so you know if you're a fiend for sugar it's coles is where to head but yeah i think that the um it definitely made some of the um, ACCC related concerns resonate a bit more for me looking at it because I'm like this, you know, in an ideal world, maybe you would want these supermarkets to be undercutting one another a bit. Whereas, mm. yeah, it's pretty clear that they just, yeah, just a lot, uh, very much aligned. Mm -hmm. Well, I think earlier in the podcast when uh, Hazard and I were talking about, uh, you know, ANZ Bank and Suncorp Bank merger happening, whether that would be good for consumers or not. Um, you know, I said, well, I don't know, because it's, it's so hard to have a definitive answer about whether that'll be a good thing or not. You know, theory might suggest that, you know, competition is good. Like we need as much competition as possible because it drives um, people to, to bring their prices down to yeah, compete for, for customers. But then, you, you know, you, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, sometimes in some sectors, like, for example, the superannuation industry, we saw there was so much competition that a lot of um, super funds were not meeting the standards required to help adequately fund people's retirement uh and they were being forced to basically merge with others to be uh, more sustainable so you know sometimes we wonder i mean you said you're looking at uh the, the uk um market supermarket um supermarket markets uh where you know, maybe there are a few more providers out there and, and they're competing for prices so what did your research there find yeah so it just i did a, a quick similar analysis of the um I did it for so uh tesco's asda sainsbury's morrison's and waitrose which would be the the five biggest supermarkets in in england and yeah there's just obviously you know broadly there's no way charging like double the price of anywhere else for mill for example but broadly there's just much more discrepancy between you know chicken will be cheaper at one place but milk is cheaper at another so it did it i guess that kind of reinforces the idea that more competition does drive down prices but we did a quick comparison of the Aussie prices in English ones and see 
but completely oversimplistic, but the only ones were still cheaper. So maybe there is something to be said for the scale that Coles and Woolies can operate at. Maybe that does mean that there are ways that they can deliver low prices to, to customers. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, where did you shop when you are in the UK? I would, we basically just went to the closest one, but I, I my, my mom liked to go to Waitrose a bit. Oh, fancy. I think, I think my old man was more of a, more of a Tesco sort of. <laughs> Waitrose, I, I actually don't think I've ever seen or been in a Waitrose. When I've, I've been in the UK a fair bit and, um, you know, I've gone to Tesco's, Morrison's, Sainsbury's, um, Waitrose, I'd not heard of. What was the other one? Um, Asda, 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 Asda is a bit cheaper than, okay. than, than Tesco's. Yeah, right. And I guess in Australia here we've got you know obviously the big two, Coles and Woolies. Got Aldi. You know, I'm an Aldi shopper. I think but Aldi is Aldi bits very underrated. Yeah, I think that you know all this you know these inquiries into Coles and Woolies. I think if people are upset, they need to start shopping at Aldi. In Australia as a whole, there's a it. It seems like it's one of the most consolidated. Like most sectors are really really consolidated with with the top two, and it's. Maybe over time, there hasn't been the, you know, competition measures put in place where, so now it's got to the point where it would be really, really difficult for say a third supermarket to emerge because of how big Coles and Woolies have been, been allowed to get. Like the, I guess that the banking thing's another one as well. Like on the back of today's decision, it's now pretty unlikely that there will be another, it will become a big five instead of a big four. Mm. It's um pretty interesting because in you know to give a shout out to another investigation into grocery prices but four corners did um a, a sort of burst on grocery prices and stuff and they found out that um a lot of the money that woolies and coles are making is from the land on their of their site so they're land banking they're buying land and which um stops competition from from setting up shop um and then uh so that that's a benefit for them and then they can sell the land or develop it years later um and that's kind of what what McDonald's does as well. Like a yeah. lot of their profits are from land, not so much the mm. shop itself, um, which I found pretty interesting as well. Um, so that might stop other grocery retailers from setting up shop. Like I think Cough Cough Land or or whatever was meant to. Um, that was the Cough Land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was meant to um, start a few years ago, but they just took one look at the Australian market and thought not nah, too hard um, to make inroads there, and that could be due to the land banking. It's hard to find a big parcel of land. Mm. Um, out there to establish a, a, a big supermarket, I guess. Um, and I, in my opinion, the ACCC has been all over the shop lately because they approved um, NAB's acquisition of City uh, and now City's pulled the pin on Diners Club. So there's only going to be one charge card provider in the market, which is Amex. Um, and then they block the acquisition um, of ANZ's acquisition of Suncorp. And then the tribunal says, no, that, that's that's a go ahead and then there's all this brow beating about grocery prices so a bit of inconsistent messaging from the from the i guess watchdog there um i mean there's there's still costco we've forgotten about that that's another one kind of this sort of slowly expanding operations in australia i think there's another one that's just opened in on the gold coast quite recently sure, been to um, costco. do they do they do everything they do but i mean it's just not like a standard supermarket really you can get you know grocery goods uh and they tend to be much larger like i think i saw the biggest tub of um you know um peanut butter that i've ever seen in my life in inside of costco so it's a bit of a novelty i think you, you you're getting a, a bit of a discount by buying in bulk mm. so some people are trying to be clever and and buy some goods in bulk via costco um, you know, it's like an absolutely enormous, um, you know, house-sized uh, thing of toilet paper. <laughs> or, yeah, you know... You're There's also a membership fee for or... Costco as well, which I think is 60 thing, bucks. It adds up. Yeah. And they're often in far-flung areas, so yeah. you like, make the commitment to drive there. I know. I mean, the one for Brisbane, you have to drive out to, like, North Lakes, um, unless there's a newer one that's open. But I remember I was just like... You, we'd only go there, you know, on the way up to the Sunshine Coast because just a bit of a novelty to pop in and have a look and go, wow, look how crazy this is. It would be interesting to see in, you know, super rural areas where there's probably, it isn't a Coles or Woolies servicing, mm -hmm. like in um, Longreach, for example, it is a, it's an IGA. It would be interesting to yeah, see on. Yeah. those kind of, like, you know, the smaller ones who operate out there, what how their prices mm -hmm. compare to, to Coles and Woolies. Because I guess if, you know, people in the bush are paying a lot more than we are for groceries it would mm. kind of you know show that maybe competition isn't the be all and end all mm -hmm. and 
it's maybe a good thing that Coles and Woolies can operate on the size they do. Yeah, potentially. That's the thing. But I also think uh, maybe uh, people are slamming them a bit harder than necessary. That could be a controversial opinion. But, you know, Coles and Woolies operate on a very low margin, high volume type of business. So it's it's purely based on volume and the scale that they have. From what I understand in the UK, I, I think um, their margins, like profit margins, are around 4.8 to 5%. The UK supermarkets are around high twos, threes, even mm. like like high trees as well so like i think it's, it's not crazy times yeah yeah so and in australia you know like as as you kind of suggested there that you know we're a long way from a lot of places uh shipping for goods that we don't produce here um is expensive and costly and we just don't have you know we have a few sort of mid, mid-sized cities in the grand scheme of things and a few couple of regional towns and then there's a big lot of nothing in the middle so trucking and all and trains and stuff costs a lot as well but anyway, we could talk all day about grocery prices. So we get so fired up about it. Uh, it is interesting, though. You know, and, um, uh, you know, and as we mentioned, you know, Harry's got uh, the grocery price index on page on savings.com.au. You can find it there. Or you can actually just Google uh, grocery prices Australia and uh, you'll find the, the, the page, I think, is ranking one or two on Google. So um, it's doing quite well. Um, and, and basically, yeah, he's, he's just going through <laughs> Coles and Woolies and then looking at um, all their prices each month uh, they're around the same time of, of each month they're collecting the prices for each good so we're going to track that uh, we've only got you know three months worth of data so far but we're going to track that and you know within a year I think we're going to have some really cool insights into how much prices are increasing or decreasing so yeah keep up the good work Harry and thanks for joining us on the savings tip chart thanks for having me All right, time for our fiscal focus segment, as always, sponsored by InfoChoice, your choice of information on Australian consumer finance. Now, investing is a pretty key part to building wealth over time and achieving financial independence. And one particular type of investment, which has experienced a surge in popularity in recent years, particularly among young Australians, is exchange traded funds or ETFs. Joining us to discuss is Jessica Lung. Portfolio Manager from Global X ETFs. Jessica, welcome to the Savings Tip Jar. Hi, thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us, Jess. So just the first question, um, for those who are not in the know, um, what exactly is an ETF um, and how do they and how are they different from uh, traditional share trading? Um, and how do they offer, like, like what benefits do they have compared mm-hmm. to uh, just picking a, a, an individual stock? Sure. So an ETF stands for exchange traded funds, and essentially it's a basket of securities which aims to mimic or replicate the uh, performance of its of an underlying security. So that was probably a whole bunch of words, but let me give you another analogy, which might be easier to understand. So what I like to say ETFs are is they're kind of like your party mix of securities. So sometimes you want access, you know, you want to have an apple, you want to have a banana, you want to have um, a carrot, but then you don't want to go and buy out individually. So what an ETF does is it just packages all nicely so that in the one package or in the one ETF, you get access to all of the above. So diversification. So some of the most common ETFs that we have out there or um, track broad market cap weighted indices. So some of them include the largest 100 names listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange or even just some of the largest names on the ASX, for example. So just why this recent surge in popularity in ETFs? So why are so many more people investing in them over, say, you know, maybe similar types of investments like managed funds or listed investment companies? Mm, So we've really seen the rise of ETFs essentially since COVID with the rise of retail investors. But what I think is a key attribute and why I personally like ETFs so much is I think it's really democratized investing and it allows people from all walks of life to start their investing journey um, for long-term wealth. So like you mentioned, why ETFs over managed funds? So I think the main reason for that is that ETFs have really removed most of the barriers to entry when it comes to investing by managed funds. So back in the day, managed funds, you probably had, or you probably needed $10,000, $20,000 just to start investing. And that was by just the one managed fund or the one strategy. While now, you know, with the introduction of new technology and, and even micro investing apps, it's really allowed investors to start even with $50 or $500. So Jess, can you explain what the benefits are of an ETF structure? 
Sure. So other than going back to my party mix analogy, where I assume everyone likes sweets, um, there's actually a lot of advantages to the ETF structure. So namely diversification, cost effectiveness, ease of access and transparency. So going back to the first one, diversification. So going back to the party mix analogy, where in that one single trade, you get access to a whole bunch of different securities. So you don't have to go out and individually source them. The second one, cost effectiveness. So the management fee that you pay and including your brokerage just on the one trade for an ETF tends to be cheaper than, for example, going back to the 100 largest stocks listed on the NASDAQ is going to be cheaper than you physically going out to the NASDAQ and buying 100 stocks. Um, ease of access. So by the ETF structure is just the one ETF. So you will trade it like any other share and then you can trade it anytime during the market is open. And then as opposed to managed funds where usually is you have to fill in a form, probably you just have to physically fill it in, scan it and send it for them to just give you the one price at the end of the day. Uh, and lastly, transparency. So a lot of passive ETF providers will actually list um, all their holdings on their website that's updated very regularly. So ours are updated on our website every single day. So you know exactly what you're investing into. I guess one thing about about that with the party mix of of stocks is um, rather than you know investing in one particular company in one particular industry that you like, mm -hmm. you can invest in the entire industry that you like. Say you're, you're really into um, you know, agriculture. I, I think there's an ETF called Food. I think you know, the, oh. the ticket name is actually Food, and it's a basket of um, farming agribusiness um, companies. And then there's, you know, you can invest in health. So it's a, a whole package of, you know, healthcare related businesses. So I guess the question for this one, Jess, is, you know, how can investors potentially stand to benefit by, by leveraging these uh, structural mega trends, I, I guess you could call them, via thematic ETFs? Sure. Yeah. So I think you've touched on a really great point is that kind of historically, maybe investors have been burnt because they've kind of put all their eggs in one basket. So like all their eggs in one name and that's maybe done really uh, poorly or they've done um, penny stocks or just kind of chased uh, the it stock at the moment. So that really goes back to the point of diversification. So one of the key advantages of an ETF is that it gives you access to a whole bunch of securities. So instead of essentially maybe in the past, you're looking for the needle in the haystack, you now you know that the haystack is going to do well because it's a structural um, tailwind, you know, it's a strong thematic, then you just buy the whole uh, whole haystack. And then, you know, eventually over time, if uh, given your longer term time horizon, that the theme should outperform and give you good performance. Dom mentioned a couple of uh, sort of funny sounding ETFs there uh, yeah, around food and and whatnot. Um, and, and one of the ways I've noticed that people in recent years have gotten into share trading is through a bit of novelty, a bit of fun. Um, you, you know, one one uh, ETF that I've noticed out there focuses on stuff that's bad for you. So they invest in, uh, <laughs> in, in weapons, uh, junk food, alcohol, tobacco, right. and so on. Uh, so what sort of uh, more fun sort of asset classes or ETFs does uh, GlobalX offer or what what ones have you seen out there? Yeah, so I guess our DNA is uh, beyond ordinary and we really believe in innovation and kind of even going back to the question Dom asked before is how can you really stand to benefit from these structural tailwinds? So we really believe that, you know, what these structural megatrends look like and that they're shaping the way we live and what the future looks like is in growth. And some of the main themes that we see, um, and yeah, there's no denying it, is AI. So AI is becoming very mainstream. I'm sure some of us or yeah have used ChatGBT very recently. So you can get exposure to, you know, the key names in this area, namely your Fang stocks. So your Meta, uh, Microsoft, and Google via our Global X Fang Plus ETF. So the ticker is uh, F-A-N-G. So you get access to those names and more, including NVIDIA, which is equated. Uh, another thing, which I think is kind of related on that tech note, but different, but still very, very relatable, is cybersecurity. So I'm sure we've all kind of been hacked or the Optus hack, Medicare hack, no, sorry, Medibank, uh, Medibank hack. Um, so very prevalent. And just the number of spam calls that I'm getting every day is kind of a bit ridiculous. <laughs> so to to kind of target that, or if you want to leverage up that and, and experience the growth that's going to be put in with all the investment that's putting into this area, we have a cybersecurity ETF. So that one is the Global X cybersecurity ETF and the ticker is BUGG. 
B-U-G-G, bug. Yeah, bug. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I guess with, you know, the all the rise in uh, AI companies and, and, and you know, robot technologies, there's got to be an ETF out there, surely called called Robo, that allows you to invest in a lot we actually do. So we actually have an ETF called Robo. So the ticker is go. R-O-B-O, and that's a global <laughs> X robotics and automation ETF. So yes, that one uh, invests in robotics. And uh, of course, we are spending time and resources to looking at how best we can capture the broader AI theme as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and I guess, you know, on a slightly different note, um, perhaps one thing you're missing out with, uh, with ETFs is that... Um, <clears throat> That sort of active management, you know, because mm. an ETF tends to track a stock index. You don't have someone that's strategically, you know, picking companies that um, will will you know drive up the the value of the fund. Um, but then I guess that person needs to be paid a salary, so it tends to cost a fair bit more. Which is, I guess, maybe why ETFs are a bit more cost efficient than managed funds. But do you think um, you know investors are missing out on much by by opting for a more passively managed fund via an ETF instead of a actively managed uh, managed fund? Not necessarily. So I like that Tarko's ad, you know, like, why not both? And I think it's the core satellite strategy where you can really incorporate the benefits of both uh, to build a well-rounded portfolio that meets your uh, personal risk tolerance and especially investment goals. So this um, sat, uh, approach that I'm talking about is the core satellite approach. So kind of think about it as a planet, which is your core. So that means the majority of your portfolio will be held in a broad market cap or passive index tracking ETFs, like you mentioned, which tend to be lower costs. And also because they track a broader index, it means there's less trading and underlying or turnover, and that tends to lead to better tax efficiency outcomes as well. Uh, so you have the majority, which is your core in lower index tracking uh, ETFs, and then as a satellite, so um, that's where you can be a bit more strategic about your positions. So you can do uh, actively managed fund, or you can do a thematic ETF, or other um, exposures that you want as well. Just off that, we'll talk about uh, the sort of 2024 outlook, how it's shaping up, how it's looking uh, for this year. Um, how might any sort of geopolitical events uh sort of shape people's investment strategies uh, this year? Yeah, so I think just even on the landscape, especially this year and the last two years, it's just a lot of uncertainty. So anything, everything that we're going through now, so interest rates, geo, geopolitics, it all just leads to uncertainty. But that's why I think it really comes back to what is your long-term investment approach? What is your investment goals? And yes, we are experiencing you know, some volatility here and potentially uh, you might wanna take advantage of this, but then you can maybe position those in your satellite positions. So taking up smaller positions in your overall portfolio, but uh, that's why the core satellite approach is still better in the sense that it will help you achieve your long-term investment goals. Yeah, certainly sounds like a pretty good balance. And I guess, you know, you can't really get have gains without having a bit of risk involved too. So there's always stuff like that to consider, uh, to look out for uh, throughout the year. That is 2024. So uh, Jessica, really appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for joining us on the Savings Tip Jar podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been great fun. Perfect. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the end of another episode of the Savings Tip Jar podcast. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, InfoChoice and Savings.com.au. You can go to those websites to compare financial products and discover a wide range of savings guides, news, and tips. Uh, thanks, of course, to our guests, uh, Jessica Lung and Harry O'Sullivan. Uh, and thanks, of course, to our loyal listeners for tuning into our half century of episodes. And thank you, Harrison, for joining me along for this crazy ride of 50 episodes. Thank you, Dom. Wouldn't be possible without you, my uh, loyal co-host here. Um, and I should mention too that I'll be off for the next couple of weeks, so um, you'll hear the lovely tones of Emma Duffy, one of our friends of the pod, uh, stepping into my chair uh, while I'm away, um, and I'll leave that in her capable hands. Um, and also as well, if you have any feedback, you know, uh, you don't need to just reach out to inquiries at savings.com.au, that's inquiries with an E. But you can also just drop uh, some feedback in the Q&A section at the bottom of the episode. I believe that's at least in Spotify. Um, but yeah, feel free to give us uh, five stars, a rating, a thumbs up, comment. It goes a long way uh, in shaping our podcast and giving us a good pat on the back or some you know, constructive criticism, uh, such as uh, maybe my hair is too short or something like that. So um, feel free to do that. Podcast um, member, they, uh, 
unless they're watching the video but um yeah maybe they'll critique our voices over our appearance yeah um so by all means do that um and me personally i'll catch skin. you in the next yeah i'll catch you the next few weeks um but keep on listening and you'll see another episode next week or hear yeah. another episode next week so yes harrison is off uh, on a bit of a break um going through japan i believe doing a bit of skiing and a bit of sightseeing Hi. so it should be really nice so enjoy that has and uh, as as has mentioned uh, emma will be uh keeping his seat warm uh for the next couple of weeks so uh awesome all right until then uh thanks for joining us and uh, be sure to tune in next week arigato